I'd like to welcome you to the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. We're really happy to have you here uh, on this very imp uh, important day. And uh, when we get to commemorate the Jews that have been displaced from their homelands in Arab countries and in Iran. As the executive vice president of the synagogue and as the president of the Iraqi Babylonian Jewish community of Montreal, I'd like to welcome you. My name is David Nathaniel. I'm fortunate to have a nice participation from various co-sponsors that you can see on the screen. And thank you to all of them for participating, for supporting this very important event and this very special day. And uh, I'm gonna share the agenda with you. As you can see, we have a really nice uh, schedule and agenda so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Charles is the president of the uh, Spanish Portuguese synagogue here in Montreal. He, uh, he moved, actually escaped from Iraq to move to Montreal the, at, at the age of five in 1965. And uh, he's, a, he's a, uh, a certified professional accountant and a chartered accountant uh, graduating from McGill University. He, he operates a full service accounting firm in Montreal and uh, he's married to Lucy Gurgi, and they have two lovely children, Michael and Sophie. So Charles, if you could just say a few words, we'd appreciate that. Dear friends, my name is Charles Shemi. I'm the president of the Spanish and, and Portuguese synagogue of Montreal. We are very proud to host this year's commemoration of the displacement of Jews from Arab lands. I would like to thank David Nathaniel for organizing this event. I would also like to thank all of the participants to this important and historical event. I am truly moved by this evening's gathering. It seems like we have a really good uh, crowd and uh, it's a testimony to keep our history alive and passed on vividly to our children. Our synagogue, Sharit Israel, hosted the Jews from Mashrak and the Maghreb since their expulsion in mid-1950. Here, they found a place of worship and brotherhood. Many of our members still feel the pain of the terrible events that preceded their departure, leaving them over 2,000 years of history. Naim Katan, of blessed memory and honorary member of our synagogue, depicted well this tragedy in his book, Farewell Babylon. As an Iraqi Jew, I remember vividly the stories told to me by my parents regarding their exodus from Iraq. It's worth to remember that Jewish communities have existed across the Middle East and North Africa since antiquity. By the time of Muslim conquest of the seventh century, these ancient communities had been ruled by various empires, including the Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Byzantine, Roman, uh, Ottoman, and Yemenite. Jews under Islamic rule were given the status of Dhimmi, along with certain other pre-Islamic religious groups. Though second-class citizens, these non-Muslim groups were nevertheless accorded certain rights and protections as people of the book. During waves of persecution in medieval Europe, many Jews found refuge in Muslim lands. For instance, Jews from the Iberian Peninsula were invited to settle in various parts of the Ottoman Empire during the Spanish Inquisition, where they would often form a prosperous model minority of merchants acting as intermediaries for their Muslim rulers. Today, Jews residing in Muslim countries have been reduced to a small fraction of their former sizes, with Iran and Turkey being home to the largest remaining Jewish populations. I feel personally that the event of this exodus was a salvation act of our Sephardic communities from the Middle East and North Africa. They all had to face many challenges in their new countries, but they bounced back and rewarded their adoptive countries with great contributions in the fields of health, science, technology, and economy, to list just a few. I would again like to welcome to you, to our Montreal congregation, and that I hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you.
now I'd like to introduce Anthony Housefather. Uh, Anthony Housefather is a member of Parliament uh, of Canada, and he re represents the riding of Mount Royal. He was first elected to Parliament in 2015 and was recently elected this past September. Anthony holds two law degrees from McGill University and an MBA from Concordia's University of John Molson School of Business. Uh, welcome, Anthony. We're very privileged to have you uh, join us this evening. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Charles. And thank you very much, David. And thank you to the Spanish and Portuguese, as well as the Association of Iraqi and Babylonian Jews for this really important event on this third night of Hanukkah. Um, as, as all of you know, we just finished Thanksgiving, which is a very joyful holiday uh, where we express our thanks and gratitude. And Hanukkah is also a holiday, which is a happy holiday of celebrating victory um, of, of the Jews over really deep adversity. Tonight, the event that we're commemorating is not quite as happy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story, in fact, of a largely forgotten exodus, a largely forgotten 850,000 Jews who had to flee from Arab um, countries and, and, and the Islamic Republic of Iran since the 1940s through no fault of their own, even though they were good people, good citizens who had loyally lived uh, along with their families in those countries for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they were suddenly told that they had to leave. They lost their belongings. In some cases, they lost all of their worldly goods. And in some cases, their family members were tortured, uh, even executed, um, especially in, in the case of Iraq. So one of the things that I wanted to say, because I don't have a personal story that I can tell myself about this exodus. It, it wasn't me or my family that it happened to. It was, it was many people who are members of this congregation who have shared with me their stories of hardship and heartbreak. And I'm sure that this evening, you'll be hearing from a lot of people who directly were impacted by what occurred um, before and after the formation of the State of Israel. But what I did want to say, again, in the spirit of Thanksgiving and in the spirit of Hanukkah, is that I am grateful. I am grateful that so many Jews from the Maghreb, so many Jews that came from Arab countries, so many Jews that came from the Islamic Republic of Iran, chose to come to Montreal. You have made a difference. You rejuvenated the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in the 1960s and 70s and thereafter. You rejuvenated the Montreal Jewish community. You have brought incredible richness and diversity to our community. C'est grâce à vous que la communauté juive de Montréal avait la chance de grandir et s'épanouir après les années 70. Vous étiez le clé de une renaissance de la communauté juive de Montréal. Avant que vous aviez arrivé, la communauté juive était vraiment une communauté qui parlait en anglais. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes une communauté bilingue, comme le portrait de Montréal, comme le portrait du Québec. Et c'est grâce à vous, les arrivants de Maroc, les arrivants d'Algérie, de Tunisie. And so, I'm really happy that despite the horrible events that occurred and that we're commemorating this evening, that so many of you chose to come to Montreal to make our community a stronger one and a better one. And I thank you for that. And so I wish you all a very, very happy Hanukkah. Um, et, et vraiment, vraiment, on devrait quand même, uh, parce que le sujet de ce soir n'est pas tellement gentil, tellement uh, bon, Nous devrions célébrer le fait que vous êtes ici avec nous. Merci et bonne soirée et joyeux Hanukkah. Thank you very much. Who uh, was elected to the National Assembly of Quebec in 2014 and in 2018 and <clears throat> represents the electoral district of Darcy McGee as a member of the Quebec Liberal Party. David has strived to promote and defend minority concerns while strengthening relationships with Quebec's francophone majority community throughout his career. Welcome, David. Merci, thank you. 
Chag Sameach to all of you, uh, the Honorable Aaron Kotler, Anthony House Father, dear rabbis, uh, dear friends, uh, many old friends that I'm uh, seeing on the list, Sylvain, uh, Ita, Steve, Sass, Gladys. Uh, I am humbled but uh, honored and pleased to be with you and to offer my best wishes on this solemn occasion on behalf of uh, my chef, Dominique Anglade. Um, I'm honored to have had a couple of opportunities in my life, in my own modest way, to be able to shed some light on this too secret um, and existential tragedy that so many of you uh, have been part of, and to your great honor, have insisted on sharing with the world and making sure that it's not forgotten. Um, if you'd allow me, uh, I had the privilege of entering into the National Assembly record on this day in 2017, uh, a, a declaration which I'll just read you quickly on the importance of uh, the tragedy that you're, you're, you're marking uh, today. Very quickly, Monsieur le Président, la circonscription de Dar es Salaam se distingue, entre autres, par la plus forte concentration de résidents issus de la communauté juive au Québec. The riding is home to many who have deep roots in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. Some of them have tragic and little-known stories to tell of how those deep roots were suddenly and brutally pulled asunder. Aujourd'hui, le 30 septembre, novembre, est une journée de commémoration de l'expulsion et de l'exode de quelques 850 000 Juifs qui ont eu à fuir leur pays natal en Syrie, en Irak, en Iran, en Égypte, en raison de la persécution dont ils furent l'objet dans la foulée de la fondation de l'État d'Israël. Today, I offer my respects to those families and to their loved ones, and to encourage us to continue to bring efforts to the to bring light to these stories, to encourage learning and remembrance of this forgotten tragedy. Also, had the honor, and I know uh, Ita Yudin, who will address you shortly, will surely remember. Uh, along with our president at the time, Joseph Gabé, of Canadian Jewish Congress, Quebec region, of holding a major seminar, again, to shed light on the tragedy of this forced exodus of Jews from Arab lands. Um, uh, in 2002, uh, uh, I believe. Um, on ne peut pas s'épargner à la fois de, de, du message de cette tragédie, qui perdent ainsi que ainsi que ces legs que vous aurez tous et vos ancêtres vécu de façon tellement difficile. Um, and Anthony alluded to it at the same time. Uh, those of us in the Jewish diaspora around the world, and I'll speak for us here in Quebec, have the honor and the joy of knowing that that tragedy in some ways contributed to allowing you to contribute so much to the communities that we are part of. And of course, to the, to the beloved state, uh, state of Israel as well. Donc, je comprends l'importance capitale de ne pas oublier. C'est une phrase qu'on invoque quand on parle de l'Holocauste, mais ça a toute sa pertinence en tout ce qui a trait euh, au vécu des familles qui ont dû fuir l'Égypte, l'Iran, le Maroc, etc. Mais aussi de prendre, de, 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 de reconnaître la contribution qu'ainsi a eu toutes vos communautés au sein de notre communauté ici au Québec and, and across the world. So, uh, I'm honored to be part of this solemn and important occasion this evening, and I wish you all the very, very best over the holidays and nothing but health and happiness and uh, the strength to continue to tell this story so that it's never forgotten. Merci. Thank you very much, David. We really appreciate you participating. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, present a recorded message from the uh, Israeli consul in Montreal, Mr. Paul Hirschson. Uh, unfortunately, Paul could not make it in person, so he sent us a message from Israel where he is Right now. À ce moment, je suis en Israël pour euh, visite avec euh, ma famille et aussi dans le, le ministère. Et, mais je suis très contente que vous, les communautés juives de Montréal, 
euh, n'oubliez pas faire les vêtements pour les, les juifs euh, qui, qui ont quitté. Ils n'ont pas seulement quitté. Les juifs réfugiés, réfugiés pardon, qui ont quitté euh, beaucoup de pays arabes. Uh, it's critical that we remember and we continue to place on the agenda um, the fact that we were in uh, many, many countries across the Middle East in the Arab world um, and were forced to leave, uh, in many cases, to leave behind family and in, in most cases to leave behind uh, possessions and belongings um, and set out again both in Israel and elsewhere in the world. Or see, you see, à Montréal, uh, making new lives, and their memory and the experience, the memory of the experience, is critical to everybody. Uh, L'année prochaine, je serai avec vous à Montréal pour cet événement important. Uh, merci beaucoup. Yes, he's the new uh, consul general. Just he hasn't been here yet. He's been to the synagogue. He came for Shabbat about a month ago. So next. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Steve Seabag, who is the first vice president at Federation CJA here in Montreal. Uh, over the last 10 years, Steve has spent most of his charitable time in various roles at Federation CJA. Currently, Steve chairs the Strategic Impact Committee of Federation CJA, whose role is to ensure that funds identified by the Budget and Finance Committee are allocated with the approval of the board uh, to its impact partners. Steve is a graduate of the Wexner Heritage Program. He is a partner in Private Wealth Management Division of Mercer Canada. Welcome, Steve. Merci beaucoup, David. J'aurais aimé être en personne avec vous, mais j'ai malheureusement un autre événement à ce moment-là. Donc, bonsoir à tous et Chag Sameach. En cette journée solennelle, je me joins à vous pour commémorer la fin abrupte des communautés juives qui habitaient les pays arabes et l'Iran au XXe siècle. Aujourd'hui, on se souvient de presque un million de réfugiés juifs, dont mes parents, mes grands-parents, et même si l'expérience, certainement au Maroc, a été traumatis moins traumatisante qu'ailleurs, qu euh, on apprend jusqu'à aujourd'hui de ces histoires où les gens sont partis, ils ont tout laissé derrière. Euh, ces gens euh, qui parfois vivaient là-bas depuis des centaines, pour ne pas dire des milliers d'années, simplement euh, demandaient de quitter simplement parce qu'ils étaient juifs. A campaign of discrimination, intolerance, and violence against Jewish communities in these lands wiped away some of the oldest Jewish settlements in the world. Jewish families, just like yours and mine, were devastated as they were thrown into exile while forced to endure injustices, appalling human rights violations, systemic violence, imprisonment, torture, and sometimes worse. They gave up everything while fleeing for their lives. Their homes, their businesses, their beloved synagogues, and their children's schools. Where Jewish communities once flourished and thrived, their traces were completely erased as Jews were forced to uproot and emigrate, leaving everything behind. Growing and prosperous centers of a peaceful and rich Jewish life ceased to exist and were entirely forgotten almost overnight. On this day, let us reflect on the plight of Jewish refugees from these lands and recognize the sacrifices they had to endure. But let us also celebrate their triumphs and their resilience, testaments to the strength of this beautiful and culturally rich community. Most importantly, the stories of Jewish refugees from Arab lands should be retold. We must not forget, and we need to find ways to amplify their voices and harness this moment for inclusion and understanding. It is critical that everyone in our community have a greater awareness of the history, culture, and traditions of our Jewish minorities. By doing so, not only will we empower our own diverse community, but we will be able to make our voices heard outside the Jewish community, where accountability for past injustices towards Jewish citizens of Arab countries, sadly, does not appear to exist. Notre communauté s'est perpétuée et émancipée malgré les terribles actes de persécution du passé. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes unis en tant que Juifs pour que nos voix, pour que nos voix soient entendues. Nous tenons à nous exprimer pour que l'héritage, souvent nié, de ces anciennes communautés juives complètement effacées de cette partie du monde ne soit jamais oublié. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. Now we have, uh, I'd like to introduce Sylvain Abitbol. Uh, Sylvain originates from Casablanca, Morocco. He immigrated to Canada with his family in 1968 
and graduated from Ecole Polytechnique in 1973 before becoming a successful entrepreneur in the high tech industry. Sylvain is presently worldwide co-president of the Justice for Jews from Arab Countries, an NGO that worked with the US Congress to get the status of refugees to Jews from Arab lands. He was a speaker at the United Nations in New York and Geneva, made presentations to the House of Lords in England and House of Commons in Canada. Under his tenure, JJAC was the organization that had the Israeli Knesset adopt November 30th as a day that commemorates the exodus of the Jews from Arab lands. Sylvain was instrumental in securing a large donation from an anonymous donor to select, mandate, and supervise a large international consulting firm to assess the losses incurred by Jews in Arab lands after 1948. The report is due to be released in the coming months, but already shows significant amounts of the hundreds of billions of dollars. JJAC expects this report to at least show another narrative to the one presented by the Palestinians, and if permitted by the donor, publish a book for education. Sylvain is past president of Federation CJA, past co-president of Canadian Jewish Congress, and past president of CSUQ, which he's representing tonight in joining us. And this is in addition to other community roles and distinctions. So a very warm welcome to Sylvain Abitbol. Thank you, David. In uh, one minute, you've summarized 20 years of work that JDAC uh, has done. Uh, I would like also to recognize the, the role of my co-president, uh, Eli Abadi, Dr. Rabbi Eli Abadi from New York, and our amazing executive director, Stanley Ehrman, from, originally from Montreal, who has been working eagerly for many, many years to get where we are. As you said, uh, David, this was a three-step strategy. The first one was to get the uh, unanimous support and recognition of the status of refugees from Arab lands at the US government. I would like also to, to thank Erwin, uh, who has been very instrumental in helping us get to every single administration a brief on the stories of the Jews from Arab lands. The goal of that recognition was to make sure that any resolution in the future would take into account the fact that the Jews also are refugees, because the uh, the uh, uh, the Article 242 talked about the refugees, not only the Palestinian refugees, but refugees also including the Jews. So this is what we got. Let me say that the only thing we had in terms of funding was a ten thousand dollars grant by the Council of, of of England in Egypt that was paid back. The Palestinians got billions of dollars. We didn't get a penny of that. In that first process of, get, of getting the recognition of the Jews as refugees, I would like to salute also of, of blessed memories, Tom Lentos, who, is, who has been the driving force in getting this recognition at the US government. Like you say, David, with the World Jewish Congress, I made a personal speech at the UN in New York, and I wish you could have seen the looks of every single Arab delegate who could not even understand what we're talking about. I had an interview with Al Jazeera, who was not aware of anything. At the presentation that we made uh, in, in, the, in England with our partner sister organization, Harif, there was an interview that was given by a young man from Al Jazeera also in, in Arabic. He wasn't aware that Jews were living in Arab lands. The second step that uh, you mentioned, David, was getting the recognition by the Knesset as it's this day to commemorate. I would like also to thank uh, the Democrat senator from, uh, from New York, Jerry Nadler, who helped us and guide us through the intricacies of Israeli politics to get the, uh, the, these data as recognition for, that, uh, for, that, uh, for the, that event. And Stan, Abay and myself were also behind this whole effort which Baruch Hashem, we got, thankfully, we got it. It's, uh, it's funny because, you know, Jerry Nadler, when he went to the, uh, landed in Israel, he was asked 
as a private citizen what he would be doing by the little lady at the, uh, at the uh, border immigration. He said, well, I'm here at a conference for Jewish refugees. And she said, I wasn't aware that there were Jewish refugees from Arab lands. Our own people don't know this history. The third part of our strategy was to negotiate, like you said, uh, uh, David, to, 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 uh, to issue an RFP, an RFQ, and the selection of a firm which was presented to Pricewaterhouse, to KPMG, to EY, rejected by all of them for political reasons. None of this organization wanted to get involved in, in something that could hurt them back. But Baker Tilly from London accepted the mandate. We built the RFQ with them and they came out with a report. I had, I just saw the la latest report last week, very well detailed. At this stage now, we gave this contract to uh, this analysis to be audited by a third party to make sure that every single approach uh, is cross-examined. It is based on a very interesting economic model, uh, in, uh, based also on, on archives that we got from, from Alliance, from different countries. So it is a very exhaustive, exhaustive document. And that, like you say, David, it's in hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, including the community properties, businesses, everything that was seized. I mean, it is very exhaustive. And what, does, what is gonna to happen to these things? You know, like you said, David, at the very least, it will be a, a narrative for Hasbara. We probably will get the approval from the donor to publish a book that will be distributed worldwide to every uh, library, Jewish school, non-Jewish school. Hopefully that will be accepted. Politically, what can we do with that? That's gonna be up to the government. I am not at liberty to, to talk about it. Some scenarios have been, have been proposed like, uh, uh, like a, uh, a conflict resolution uh, uh, conference in Harvard, for instance using this information along with all the information that the Palestinians have. I mean, I saw the, the books of the Palestinian. It's also a very exhaustive list of, of, uh, of assets that they claim have been, have been seized. But we are way, way, way more than what they have lost. So uh, here we are. Uh, actually, I'm calling you from, I'm talking to you from the other promised land, I'm in Florida. And it's always a pleasure to talk to me of the Spanish. Both my parents have been members of the Spanish until they passed away. I got married as Spanish. And actually last weekend was my son, grandson's bar mitzvah, I was Spanish. So also I'd like to, to, to thank Henry, who I see, Henry Green, who has been also instrumental in working with JJAC. Uh, Henry was with us, with us at the board, uh, the JJAC board in Atenia, if I remember correctly, uh, Henry, uh, also in Jerusalem. So here we are, uh, at least we have a day to commemorate this tragic event and let's not forget. Thank you so much, guys. Wow, that was wonderful. Wow. Very, very uh, insightful and meaningful. We really appreciate it, Sylvain. So now we have uh, an in-person in guest. Uh, her name is Ita Yudin. She's vice president of CJA. Uh, as a national nonpartisan and not-for-profit organization, the Center for Israeli and Jewish Affairs, CJA, is dedicated to improving the quality of Jewish life by promoting public policy interests and participating in social debates in the interest of all Quebec and Canada. CJA is the advocacy agency of Jewish federations across Canada and in Montreal for Federation CJA. CJA fights anti-Semitism and all forms of discrimination, defends fundamental rights and freedoms, advocates for social dust justice, and encourages support for the Israeli people. Ita has appeared as an expert witness before National Assembly Commissions and has acted as a spokesperson for CJA on Quebec and national media. She is a regular speaker to groups on a variety of issues and public policy concerns, anti-Semitism, as well as the history of Jews from Arab lands. Ita, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bonsoir, tout le monde. 
uh, it's an honor to be here in person. Actually, it's very exciting to to attend something uh, as we're starting to have uh, hybrid or in-person events. Um, I don't know if there's somewhere in the lineup that would have been a great slot, but certainly to be in between Sylvain and Erwin Cutler is not, I don't think, the ideal the ideal history. It's my story. As a professional in community, I've had the privilege, as David mentioned earlier, uh, both uh, in my role at Canadian Jewish Congress and now in my role at CJA to work on this file and to uh, speak on behalf of a voice that has been forgotten and largely ignored uh, in modern history. Um, the Jews in the different countries of the Middle East, and we're focusing a lot tonight on Iraq, but in every country throughout the Middle East, there are stories and, and narratives of entire communities and a wealth of uh, history, culture. So we're going to talk to a billion dollars in wealth, but along with that are thousands of years, in some cases, like in Iraq, of history and roots and a community that was it wasn't a fleeting community. It wasn't a small established community in Iraq, for example, in Baghdad. The Jewish community was two thirds of the population. My grandfather uh, was a member of parliament and a, an advisor to the minister of finance. And we, we were a, a vibrant and important part of Iraq's culture and community from its music to uh, to education and then certainly uh, different different stories of individuals uh, from poets to singers who who really marked um, the the culture of the time uh, in the last days I think of the Jewish community in Iraq um, we learn in history and we talk a lot about the experience of the Jews in Europe but we don't really talk about the experience of the Jews from Arab lands. We had the Farhud, we had uh, dispossession, we had anti-Semitism, we had violence. And I think if, if those communities hadn't fled friends uh, with us on screen and in the room today, hadn't left when they did, we would, have, we would be telling a very different story of, of the Jews, of the Jews of the Middle East. Um, I remember, and I can't help, I'm, I'm looking right at Lizette and, and, and Gabby, I remember the, the conference David talked about in 2002. It was, uh, I think one of the, it was certainly the first time in North America. I can't remember if it was right before there was a conference in England or right after was a conference with, uh, with World Jewish Congress before. We were the first conference, I'm being, I'm being signaled. We were the first conference um, to really focus on the issue of Jews from Arab lands. Uh, Lisette and at the time, Irene Buenavida, Zichonali Bracha were, were my partners in crime in, in starting to try to find people who were willing to tell their story and share their narrative. When I grew up, I heard all this for me. I don't know if it was from a reluctance of, of telling, of sharing. And it, it's amazing how in recent years, when I think back to 2002, when some of our some of our witnesses testimonials were scared to use their real names uh, in sharing their stories to today where we have uh, groups like Sephardi Voices and, and uh, recording one testimonial after another to preserve this important history. It's so important that we share these stories that we acknowledge the history. I never once, even though my mother left stateless from Iraq uh, without even proof that she went to high school, had to rebuild her life and start over. I never really once heard her call herself. And I think if I ever called her a refugee, she would be upset with me. They came, whether it was to Israel, I think about half of Israel's population today uh, is made up of Jews from the Middle East. They came, they settled around the world. My mother came to Canada and, and made Quebec her home. Um, and, you know, if you think in stark contrast, the amount of attention the UN has paid to uh, Palestinian refugees, setting up an agency to deal with that, uh, to deal with them, and the amount of neglect and inattention the world and the UN has paid to the story of Jews from Arab lands. Mm -hmm. The time is now to share our story, to share our history, um, and, and, and to share... Uh, 
to share our, our narrative. I think, you know, I know I, there's, there's not much I can say that, that Sylvain hasn't said and that I, I suspect Erwin will, will get into shortly, um, and I'm not going to compete. But what I do want to share is that we have made some strides. So for now, Canada, and as Sylvain mentioned, the, the US um, have both acknowledged the plight of the uh, exodus of Jews from Arab lands, and, and in both cases have, have highlighted the need for their history and their narrative, our history and our narrative, to be factored into any ultimate uh, resolution to the to the Israel. and I think we have to move beyond talking to ourselves we have to talk to others uh, you know David read his declaration at the National Assembly which was amazing and it, it, it's it's happened uh, you know I think he read it again uh, in 20 that was from 2017 I think he read it again in 2018 and I know there was a similar declaration in, in 2016 uh, from Benoit Charette, who's now the minister uh, responsible for the fight against racism. I think the more we talk about our story, the more we have people like David and Anthony in positions to share our story and to echo, uh, to echo our, our concerns and our narrative, the more it becomes not just the story of a few people in a room or on a hybrid webinar, but part of our history that really hasn't been anchored or rooted in, in the history books in the way that many other narratives have. And I, I, you know, I really uh, commend the, the Babylonian Committee of the Spanish uh, and Portuguese and the Spanish and Portuguese for putting together this event. I'm proud to be speaking on behalf uh, of CJA. I'm, I'm proud of, of what we do when we come together as a community. It's not Sephardic, it's not Ashkenaz, it's everyone. We're one community, we have one history, and we have to do our part to make it everyone's history and to make our history known. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ita. We really appreciate that. And now I'd like to introduce Erwin Kotler, Professor Erwin Kotler, the Honorable Erwin Kotler. Uh, who is the founder and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and an international human rights lawyer. He is Prime Minister Trudeau's special envoy on, envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and, and combating anti-Semitism, a privy counselor and officer of the Order of Canada an officer of the National Order of Quebec and a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Wow. Professor Kotler is the recipient of 14 honorary doctorates and numerous awards from institutions in Canada and around the world. And Erwin, we're very, very fortunate to have you join us this evening. Thank you very much. David, thank you for those very uh, kind words of introduction. Chers amis, chaverim, friends, I'm delighted to participate in this timely and significant gathering uh, organized by the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue uh, in association uh, with their partners. And this is yet another evening of remembrance and reminder, le devoir de memoir, that the Spanish SP synagogue has, has organized, an evening where we can come together and bear witness, and we are in the presence of those whose testimonies can make reference to compelling truths and also to take action. And I want to just say that uh, I myself am proud, and as many of you know, I'm married to an Israeli of Iraqi origin, and so we share these uh, experiences, uh, these stories, uh, this witness testimony. I recently had occasion uh, to give a talk, not the first of its kind, nor was the response the first of its kind, but it is related to this evening. I gave a talk on uh, the prevention and combating of mass atrocities and genocide. And I referred, of course, it was during Holocaust education months, uh, to the Holocaust as a paradigm of radical evil and to the genocide that followed from the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda to more recently the mass atrocities targeting uh, the Rohingya 
and the uh, Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province of China. When I concluded my remarks, a uh, person in the audience in the Q&A session uh, made reference, and this has happened before, but this time in a, in a more extensive way, uh, to the fact that in my remarks, I had not spoken at all about Palestinian suffering, that I had not spoken of the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe that befell the Palestinian people. This had been said to me before, but now it was in particular blamed on what was re referenced as the mass atrocities committed by the apartheid state Israel for the last 74 years against the Palestinians. Uh, in my reply, I began by saying, uh, you're right, the Palestinians have suffered and continued to suffer. You're right that the Palestinians have suffered a Nakba a catastrophe 74 years ago. I said, but what happened 74 years ago? Because we are meeting today uh, right after Kaftet in November, right after the 74th anniversary commemoration yesterday of the UN General Assembly uh, partition resolution recommending the partition of mandatory Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and a Arab state. The, Palestinian, the Jewish leadership at the time accepted that resolution. The Palestinian and Arab leadership did not. Mind you, as I've said before, they had a right to reject the resolution if they felt that it did not comport with their sense of aspiration and purpose. But what they didn't have a right to do is to then launch a war of aggression against the nascent Jewish state, which they spoke of as a war of extermination against uh, the Jewish uh, people then in mandatory Palestine. And what they didn't have a right to do was to then launch another war of aggression against Jewish nationals living in Arab countries, dispossessing them of their rights and their property, expelling them, torturing them, murdering them, exiling, all that you've heard uh, before in, 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 in testimony. So as a result of these two acts of aggression, we had two sets of refugees. Palestinian refugees as a result of the Arab and Palestinian onslaught against the nascent Jewish state, and Jewish refugees from Arab countries as a result of the Arab aggression against their own Jewish nationals. And it's a tragedy to think 74 years later that had the Arab and Palestinian leadership accepted that partition resolution, we today would be commemorating and indeed celebrating 74 years of what we speak about of two states for two peoples and ignored the human and avoided all the human suffering since then, let alone, and this is what has become increasingly uh, prominent, let alone the false misrepresentations and false narratives and the demonological anti-Semitism, as I shared yesterday in my meeting with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau when my mandate as special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism was renewed. And I said, what we've seen has been a resurgent demonological anti-Semitism. And that began to find expression, regrettably, 74 years ago, an expression in these inverted narratives today, which speak of the apartheid state Israel being responsible for the mass atrocities endured by the Palestinians for the last 74 years. And so what I'd like to do, and uh, this will be the second part and closing part of my remarks, is just share with you an action plan regarding this forgotten and forced exodus three Jewish refugees from Arab countries and Iran. What is it that we must do? How do we take this evening of remembrance and bearing witness and also give it expression in action? So here is a summary of an action plan. And since this is an audience uh, which understands context and content, I will do so in a series of one-liners. Number one, we need to restore awareness and understanding of the pain and plight of Jewish refugees from Arab lands to the international peace and justice agenda from which it has been expunged 
and eclipse effectively these past 74 years. This is not only a case of justice delayed and justice denied, but this is a case of where the injustice has never been properly understood to begin with, and where the case and cause of that justice, of the pain and plight of Jewish refugees from Arab countries, which is not only insufficiently known and understood, but increasingly misrepresented and mischaracterized to restore the truth and justice to the international agenda. Second, the UN has regrettably participated in this process of expunging and eclipsing these truths. And therefore, this false narrative is itself a result of the false misrepresentations made by the United Nations itself. And so we need to call upon the UN to establish a UN documentation center, which will report the truth and the justice of this case and cause. Number three, remedies for victim refugee groups. And I've been involved in representations for victim refugee groups globally for some 40 years now, but such remedies, remedies with respect to uh, rights to remembrance, to truth and to justice must be restored for Jewish refugees from Arab countries in the same way that we have such remedies for other victim refugee groups. Number four, in a matter of seeking justice for victims and accountability for human rights violators, all those involved in the displacement and dispossession in the disenfranchisement and the criminal assault on Jewish refugees, all Arab countries involved in those criminal violations of human rights must bear responsibility for their criminal acts. Indeed, 15 years ago, I co-authored an article with Stan Ehrman, uh, referenced uh, before, and also with uh, my colleague and lawyer David Matus, who was called Rights and Redress, Justice for Jews in Arab Countries, where we disclosed that already in 1947, the Arab League and the Arab countries had a blueprint with respect to this disenfranchisement, to this denationalizing, to the dispossession, to the forced exiles of Jewish uh, from Arab uh, lands, and that this pillaging and torture, etc., and expulsion did not happen par hasard by accident. In fact, it was set forth in a blueprint by the Arab League and Arab states for that purpose. Number five, the Arab League plan of 2002 and variations thereof should therefore now include reference to Jewish refugees from those Arab countries to the forgotten and forced exodus in the same way that the state of Israel references the situation of Palestinian refugees in their understanding of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As we speak, and here in Canada, we speak, and rightly so, about the pain and plight of indigenous peoples in Canada, we have to begin with the search for truth, with the search for justice, with the basis for reconciliation, as we do so for, recon for indigenous peoples, so must be done for Jewish refugees from Arab countries, because let there be no mistake about it. And this is a truth that not only must be affirmed, but reaffirmed again and again. The Jewish people are not only an indigenous people to the Middle East, but the history of Jews from Arab lands goes back 2,500 years. It precedes even the arrival of Islam or Arabs. And so indigeneity is a common and shared experience of the Jewish people in Arab countries, just as the Jewish people, with respect to the Jews in the state of Israel, are a prototypical indigenous people, a people that still inhabits the same land, embraces the same religion, studies the same indigenous Torah, observes the same indigenous traditions, as we are now this evening, the indigenous tradition of Hanukkah, or then later uh, in the spring, the indigenous tradition of Passover, hearkens to the same indigenous prophets, speaks the same 
indigenous language Hebrew and bears the same indigenous name 25 uh, that we had uh, some 25 and 3,500 years ago, namely Israel. So we are a prototypical indigenous people and we are at the same time a prototypical anti-colonialist people. And Hanukkah reminds us of that struggle against colonialism throughout the centuries. So this notion of the Jewish people as a prototypical indigenous people, a prototypical anti-colonialist people, a multicultural, multinational, multi-religious, multi-ethnic indigenous Jewish community and Jewish people in Israel is something that we must not only ourselves affirm, but we sometimes have to learn that which we must affirm. Number six, and I'll go quickly uh, in this action plan, the UN General Assembly, in the interest of both the search for truth and the search for justice and peace, must make reference to Jewish refugees in their ongoing resolutions on the Middle East. Yet as we meet, while the UN General Assembly has adopted more than 200 resolutions referencing the Middle East, there is not one resolution, I repeat, not one resolution of the UN General Assembly that has ever referenced the case of Jewish refugees in Arab country. The UN Human Rights Council, whose mandate is the promotion and protection of human rights, has yet even to address the issue of Jewish refugees from Arab countries, while it has a specific item seven on its agenda, which mandates at every hearing of the UN Human Rights Council, and I've been there, a kind of Alice in Wonderland uh, situation where the situation of violations against by Israel in the occupied territories that is put is an item on every agenda, whereas any violations against Israel, let alone Jewish refugees from Arab lands, their pain and plight has never been referenced. Number seven, yesterday in the annual November 29th commemoration of the United Nations of an international day of solidarity with the Palestinian people, there was no reference uh, to the Jewish people. And so we need to ask that the UN if it is going to have an international day of solidarity, has to have an international day of solidarity, not only for the Palestinian people, but for the Jewish people. Otherwise, it makes a mockery of the notion of two states for two peoples. And so we have to call upon uh, the UN, if you're going to, on November 29th, commemorate the UN General Assembly partition resolution, you must make reference to this whole case and cause of Jewish refugees from Arab countries as part of the framework of two states for two peoples. Number eight, jurisdiction over Palestinian refugees must be transferred from UNRWA to <clears throat> the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. There was no reason then, and there's no reason now that there's a separate agency for Palestinian refugees when this should be part of the international refugee treatment under the UN High Commission for Refugees, particularly when under UNRWA, we have had and continue to have a history of the teaching of incitement and false narratives with respect uh, to peace and justice in the Middle East, no reference ever to justice for Jews from Arab countries and thereby further misrepresentations and distortions of the truth of facts and justice. Nine, any bilateral Israeli-Palestinian negotiation, whether it emanates from a Middle East forum, from a G7 forum, must always make reference to Jewish refugees from Arab countries at the same way it makes reference to Palestinian uh, refugees. We cannot have a culture of impunity in these discussions, let alone a culture of erasure, of erasing the history the narrative, the justice of Jewish refugees from Arab countries. And finally, we need to initiate in European parliaments, uh, parliamentary hearings in the same way as we had in the US Congress, in the Canadian parliament as was referenced, in the same way that the US Congress and the Canadian parliament, when I was then a member of parliament, adopted a resolution with respect to the recognition of Jewish refugees from uh, Arab lands. We need to see this uh, having taken taking place in Europe, and I recently appeared before the UK Parliament for that purpose. In conclusion, we have a responsibility 
to not only address, but redress the false and distorted narrative which underpins the no double Nakba with which I uh, began, where Israel bears blame for all the alleged mass atrocities in the Middle East. Let there be no mistake about it. And in our correction of that fa false narrative, where there is no remembrance, no remembrance of the pain and plight of Jewish refugees from Arab land, there will be no truth. And where there is no truth, there will be no justice. And where there is no justice, there will not be authentic reconciliation for two states, for two peoples. If that is not going to just be an idle and lazy slogan, but is going to be something meaningful with respect to the pursuit of international peace and justice, it must begin with a recognition of the truth and justice with respect to Jewish refugees from Arab lands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kotler. That was definitely enlightening uh, and extremely educational. I think it, you know, I think when the, we saw the, the, the recent Palestinian uh, protests uh, that occurred, uh, we all felt this huge injustice and lack of balance in reporting. And I think you, you, you know, many of the things you touched on reflect that. So thank you once again. I'd like to now, uh, uh, we're gonna now show a recorded mes message from Michael Mostyn. Uh, he's the CEO of B'nai B'rith Canada. Uh, he has a few words for us as well as uh, a short presentation. Good evening. I'm Michael Mostyn, Chief Executive Officer of B'nai B'rith Canada. Today, along with Jewish communities around the diaspora and in Israel, we commemorate the expulsion of Jews from Arab countries in Iran. The first expulsion of Jews from Arab countries in Iran began in the late 1940s and continued into the 1950s. In the process, 850,000 Jews were forcefully expelled from their homes, communities, and nations. Many left behind all material possessions and escaped only with their lives. These Jews, many who spoke only Arabic or Farsi, were forced to start anew either in the diaspora or in Israel, where they made significant contributions to their societies. Despite their resilience and bravery, and no matter their efforts to maintain their traditions, the expulsions of Jews led to the end of a 2,500 year long history in Arab countries and Iran. Today, from Lebanon to Libya, Jewish communities remain very small and nearly non-existent, yet, these regimes that so brutally turned on their Jewish citizens failed to grasp the impossibility of ever completely erasing the Jewish histories of those countries. Indeed, the Jews from Arab countries and Iran remain alive in the history of the countries that expelled them. Today, a traveler to Beirut or Baghdad may be hard pressed to find a Jew, but if one takes the time to look closely at the art and architecture of these cities, takes the time to study the history of these magnificent regions. The Jewish contributions are identifiable and impossible to deny. This essence lives on in their descendants around the world, including here in Montreal and in Israel, where the traditions of these communities remain alive. Thank you for joining us this evening. Today is an annual day of commemoration to remember the overlooked and forgotten history of the Jewish refugees from Arab countries and Iran who were displaced from their ancient communities they've lived in for over 2,500 years. Approximately 850,000 Jews from Arab countries and Iran were forced to migrate in a mass exodus around 1948 and beyond, during the time that the State of Israel declared its independence and in the years following. The first few massive waves of migration took place in the late 1940s and early 1950s, primarily from Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. Almost all of these entire Jewish communities were forced to leave their respective countries with almost none of their belongings. Their properties, such as homes, were seized by the government, and many could only take with them articles of clothing and family heirlooms. Later waves of migration peaked during the 1956 Suez Crisis in Egypt, and many other countries followed suit in attempting to forcibly remove their Jewish populations. 
In total, around 70% of the Jewish communities immigrated to the newly founded State of Israel, and the remaining 30% settled in France and the United States of America. Today, only a very small number of Jews remain in the Arab world and Iran, paling in comparison to what these communities once looked like. Since the fall of the Second Temple period and displacement of the Jewish population outside of Israel, many Jews had settled in other areas of the Middle East and North Africa. While some traveled further to Europe and beyond, a large number of Jewish communities continued to live in the Middle East where they thrived, creating unique dishes, music, art, and many other traditions still observed to this day. Each of these Jewish communities have a very rich and unique identity, which developed over time alongside other groups in the countries they lived in. Although life wasn't always perfect, throughout the Middle Ages, many more Jews from the Iberian Peninsula sought refuge in Muslim lands such as Morocco during the time of the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions, where Jewish and Muslim communities were forced to either convert to Catholicism or be killed or expelled. In the 19th century, during the scramble for Africa and the further colonization of the Middle East by the European powers, many of these nations had begun to become more increasingly unstable. The Jewish communities had always been a minority, but they then found themselves at a crossroad between themselves, other native peoples, and the European colonists. In 1948, the Arab-Israeli war broke out, ending in a victory for Israel. This, however, caused riots and pogroms all across the Middle East targeted primarily at the Jewish communities. Entire towns were razed and the Jewish people were forced to flee. Some countries allowed Jewish emigration out of the country, such as Iraq in 1950, that allowed Jews to leave on the condition that they relinquish their Iraqi citizenship. Many nations did not allow Jewish emigration at first, but quickly followed suit in letting them leave after pressures from world leaders. Subsequently, Israel successfully completed many missions, airlifting thousands of Jews out of Yemen, Morocco, and Iraq. The last of the mass exodus events to occur was that of Iran following the 1979 Islamic Revolution, though many Jews had decided to migrate prior. In 1948, there were approximately 150,000 Jews living in Iran. Around one-third of those Jews left Iran for Israel. In 1979, following the revolution, almost all the remaining Jews left. Only around 20,000 remained, and today that number has dwindled down to around 8,500 people. This period of migrations marked a sad time for the ancient communities of Jews that had called these nations their home for better or for worse. Although they faced many hardships, a new chapter in their lives were just beginning as they immigrated primarily to Israel, the USA, France, and Canada. They obtained more rights, enjoyed religious freedoms, as well as a secured safety from the state. Unfortunately, there has not been any justice or restitution for the refugees and their descendants. An estimate between $100 billion to $300 billion of property value was lost amongst the combined wealth of the Jewish communities of the Middle East and North Africa. Today, we pay tribute to these Jewish communities. Okay, now I'd like to introduce Yannick Elbaz from the World Jewish Congress Diplomatic Corps. So Yannick holds a business degree as well as an MBA. He is currently based in Montreal. Uh, for over a decade, he's been deeply engaged with the worldwide Jewish community through many years of involvement on the national and international stage. Yannick was chair of the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, CJA Ambassadors Program, where he regularly met with politicians on behalf of CJA to advocate for issues important to the Canadian Jewish community. In 2019, Yannick was recruited to join the World Jewish Congress Jewish Diplomatic Corps, representing the community on local and international subjects. Yannick has gained intimate knowledge of the rise of anti-Semitism and online hate in the region, witnessing firsthand the divisiveness it causes and the violence in some Canadian cities. He brings a wealth of knowledge and best practices on championing for Israel and the Jewish community. He develops and maintains relationships with other, other communities by having meaningful conversations with students on campuses, political figures, and business leaders. Welcome, Yannick. Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs, et Hanouka Sameach. Il me fait grandement d'être plaisir ce soir en tant que représentant du Congrès juif mondial et ambassadeur du Centre consultatif des relations juives et israéliennes, SIJA. Depuis plus d'une décennie, je me suis engagé auprès de la communauté juive mondiale à travers de nombreuses années d'implication sur la scène nationale et internationale. En tant que juif marocain, né et élevé à Montréal, 
être présent ce soir me touche grandement. Comme plusieurs membres de notre communauté, ma famille a quitté son pays natal d'Afrique du Nord, le Maroc, pour s'établir au Canada. Le 24 novembre 1947, à peine cinq jours avant le vote de partition aux Nations Unies, créant à partir du mandat britannique deux États pour deux peuples, le chef de la délégation égyptienne à l'ONU affirmait « Les vies d'un million de Juifs dans les pays musulmans seront mises en danger par la création d'un État juif ». Ces mots s'avèrent annonciateurs de ce qui allait suivre. Selon les statistiques officielles, plus de 850 000 Juifs furent forcés de quitter leur foyer d'Afrique du Nord et au Moyen-Orient entre les années 40 et le début des années 70, laissant derrière eux d'importants biens et avoirs. Le déplacement forcé des Juifs des pays arabes a été marqué par l'incitation de la part des autorités, par le vol, par des violentes manifestations, par des attaques incendiaires, par des pogroms et par le meurtre. Ce traumatisme, cette haine, cette violence sont profondément inscrites dans des mémoires de la communauté séfarade et dans la mémoire de notre peuple. Au Canada, nous nous rappellerons que par suite de requêtes de la part du Congrès juif canadien en 1956, le gouvernement a décidé, considérant les besoins humanitaires urgents, de renoncer aux mesures de sécurité habituelles et de faciliter l'établissement des Juifs d'Afrique du Nord et du Moyen-Orient. Ainsi, pour prendre exemple à mon pays d'origine, de ma famille, entre 1948 et 1967, 25 000 Juifs marocains sont venus au Canada, faisant partie de l'exode de 200 000 Juifs marocains. Des milliers et des milliers de Juifs ont fui les persécutions d'Afrique du Nord et au Moyen-Orient en s'établissant en Israël, au Canada et ailleurs avec leurs familles pour y construire une nouvelle vie. En 2014, le gouvernement d'Israël a désigné le 30 novembre comme jour de souvenir des réfugiés juifs des pays arabes. Le Canada reconnaît officiellement l'expérience des réfugiés juifs qui ont été déplacés des pays du Moyen-Orient et de l'Afrique du Nord après 1948. C'est un des rares pays à reconnaître formellement les réfugiés juifs à un si haut niveau. Toutefois, aujourd'hui encore, Nombreux sont ceux qui ne connaissent absolument rien de l'expérience des Juifs du Moyen-Orient et de l'Afrique du Nord. Cela doit changer, d'où l'importance des événements comme celui d'aujourd'hui. Malgré, malgré ce passé sombre, il existe plusieurs exemples récents de tentatives des pays arabes de réparer et de restaurer les liens brisés. Ainsi au Maroc, que j'ai eu l'opportunité de visiter en 2019, même voir où mes parents ont grandi, nous observons et ressentons depuis quelques années une volonté de préservation du patrimoine juif marocain. Et sans oublier la reprise officielle des relations diplomatiques entre Israël et le Maroc, mais aussi la signature historique des accords d'Abraham avec les Émirats arabes unis et le Bahreïn. Lors de la préparation de mon discours le 24 novembre 2021, nous avons tous été témoins de la visite historique et importante de M. Benny Gantz, ministre de la Défense euh, d'Israël, qui pour la première fois dans l'histoire a rencontré son homologue, le chef d'état-major marocain. D'ailleurs, plusieurs membres de la délégation ont des origines marocaines et cette visite de 72 heures a été particulièrement émouvante, surtout lors de la visite d'une synagogue Talmutora dans la capitale nationale de Rabat. M. Benigat a signé un accord sécuritaire qui permettra aux industries militaires israéliennes d'être en contact permanent avec leurs homologues marocains. Il s'agit du premier accord du genre entre Israël et un pays arabe, ce qui devrait contribuer à la sécurité de l'État d'Israël et du peuple juif de façon durable. Tous ces développements récents apportent avec eux l'espoir de continuer à construire des ponts, à créer de nouvelles relations et à célébrer l'union de nos nations. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Yannick. Hello, everybody. I'm speaking to you from Miami, and I want to talk a little bit about Sephardi Voices and the beginnings of Yom Pli Team. Sephardi Voices records the untold stories of Jews displaced from the Arab world. What would be our, our, your earliest memories? Uh, yes, obviously. I... Our collection of interviews are being deposited in the National Library of Israel. And in the spring of 2022, the Canadian interviews will be deposited 
into the National Library in Ottawa. Since 2015, Yompli team has become the day of recognition and celebration of the journey and heritage of the Sephardi Mizrahi. But most of you probably don't know its origins. It started when a boy met his grandfather for the first time. When I met my grandparents uh, from Algeria, was the first time that uh, I realized that there was uh, a real gap, a generational gap, uh, missing of rich tradition and customs. And um, I was very thirsty once I met them to really learn much more about their lives, where they came from, what they experienced, uh, some things that my father never talked about, they were willing to share. When Danny grew up, he was not aware of the Jewish diaspora. He was a child of the Zionist ethos, a first generation of nation builders. When I grew up, I was not aware at all of the exile, the galut. We're doing away with oppression and discrimination against. And of course, after the Holocaust, we are building a new nation in our home, in our homeland. And we are capable of self-defense and of developing the country. And um, no uh, stories or any relations to the former lives of either my, of my parents. At age 18, Danny encountered the great equalizer of Israeli society. He was drafted into the army. This was the first time I spoke to people who were not privileged and who were felt that uh, maybe they were not welcomed the way, or her parents were not welcomed the way the government and the people of Israel should have. His growing awareness of the plight of displaced Jewish refugees turned into action as he entered politics and became Israel's deputy minister of foreign affairs. I was approached by um, uh, Jewish refugees and descendants of Jewish refugees from Arab countries uh, to tell me the story, not only on a personal basis, but on the full scope and epic of the strategy of the displacement of uh, the Jewish people from Arab countries. And they seek my help to, um, first of all, to promote and discover the truth, then to tell the truth to our own people and also to the world. As Deputy Foreign Minister, Danny brought the untold story of Jewish refugees to an international conference on human rights and democracy in Geneva. I also used my political um, power at the time to make sure that the Israeli government will recognize the uh, plight of the uh, Jews from Arab countries by designating a day in the calendar which will uh, honor and which will remember the Jews from the Arab countries and the plights and the tragedy that they suffered. Danny Aloan felt a sense of loss by not growing up with his Sephardi heritage. But with the next generation, that sense of loss will turn to dignity, thanks to Yom Plitim. So on that day, everyone will uh, be exposed to the story, will be encouraged, and hopefully will be curious enough to learn more on their own. And also, it will uh, be a day to instill pride of the, on the descendants uh, of the refugees from Arab countries. Uh, this will be a day which also will be marked in the curriculum in Israel and hopefully in the curriculum of Jewish schools all over the world. And this will be a start before it becomes the historical truth. We were not free to do whatever we wanted. As a child, I realized for the first time that I was different. Than we used to be scared to go out because we were One Jews. One evening, the police came and arrested my father. A bomb went into the front of the synagogue. My brother went to the roof and they shot You him. have no choice but to leave. They kicked me out with all my it's family. It's the end of the Jewish At the life. beginning, it was a shock. Well, I think all the Jewish people are survivors. I'm a Jew from Morocco for 600 years. So now I'd like to welcome Gabrielle uh, Elia Tofik. And Gabriel grew up near the Jewish neighborhood of Be uh, in the Jewish neighborhood in Beirut. Her father and a few of her relatives were members 
of the Jewish Communal Council for years. She went to the Alliance School and the Lycée Français in Beirut, graduating from teaching college in Paris thanks to the Alliance sponsorship. She has been a teacher at the Alliance in Beirut as well as in Montreal. A few years ago, Gabby published a book, The Tightrope Walk the Tight Rope Walkers, a chronicle of the Jews of Lebanon from 1925 to 1975. She was also editor of the synagogue's Elena magazine for several years, and she's here tonight to talk about the Jews of Lebanon and Syria to shell to share a compelling tale of her family. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you. With Lebanon so often in the news lately, we tend to forget that Jews lived in that country since biblical times, in Saida, Tyre, and Der Amar mostly. With time, Jews moved to Beirut, which had become a big city. In 1920, the state officially recognized the Jewish community of Lebanon as part of the 18 religious sects. After the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, Lebanon was the only country where the Jewish population increased in number with the arrival of Jews from Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. However, Lebanon had joined the League of Arab Nations to fight Israel. Furthermore, fierce demonstrations were marching in the streets of Beirut. As a result, a few Jewish families left while the southern border with Israel was still porous. Syria notoriously mistreated Jewish communities. A number of Jews had already left Damascus in the 1920s and Aleppo after the pogrom of 1947. In 1948, Syria clamped down on the remaining Jewish population, kept them hostage and prevented them from leaving. But Lebanon helped those who fled Arab countries, allowed them to work, or gave them a one-way laissez-passer to leave the country. Nevertheless, in 1961, our phone was tapped, our apartment methodically searched, my father arrested and sent to the Ramleh prison. He was accused of spying for Israel. His lawyer was able to prove that my dad had not dealt in military nor strategic secrets, but they, that he had merely helped Jews who had fled Syria to get to Western countries. Although he was cleared of any spying charges and released, his passport was withheld. He was not allowed to leave the country. This made it impossible for him to work as an import-export trader. The Jewish Community Council appointed him as its secretary. As such, he looked after the health, social, religious, and legal welfare of the members. In 1970, escapes of young Jews from Damascus increased because of continuous harsh treatment from the Syrian police. As soon as they arrived in Beirut, these youngsters went straight to the Magen Abraham synagogue and my father Alvera Elia's office. His name for them had become a dream to achieve a talisman synonymous with newfound freedom and renewed future. The Beirut Jewish community lived moments of anguish every time Syrian Jews arrived. My dad made sure they were dispersed within families in the Jewish neighborhood. We all held our breath until these teens left by road, air, or sea. In 1971, as a few Syrian teenagers had just arrived in Beirut, we learned that the previous group had been intercepted by Syrian security on the way from Damascus towards the Lebanese border. The boys had been summarily arrested, extensively questioned, and thrown in jail. This dramatic development meant that the illegal refugees who were still in Beirut had to be sent immediately out of the country. Lebanese soldiers came to the rescue to drive them south and through the border to Israel. Meanwhile, under tight interrogation, the young Jews who had been arrested in Damascus had admitted to know only one contact in Beirut, Albert Elia. The Syrian Second Bureau, the Mohabarat, decided to inquire more closely 
and put my dad under surveillance. Somehow my dad learned of this and asked for the protection of the Lebanese security. An agent was appointed to accompany him wherever he went. Unfortunately, on Monday, September 6, 1971, the agent did not show up. My dad left by himself for the office. On the street, just outside our home, he was forced into a car and nobody ever saw him again. Meantime, in Montreal, I learned of the abduction through the New York Times newspaper. I was totally distraught and flew to Beirut. Once in Lebanon, I insisted on going all the way to the president of the Republic, Suleiman Frangie, and managed to get an audience with him. Remarkably, he received me with great simplicity. He had known my father and held him in high regard. However, he could not help me since my dad was most likely not on Lebanese soil. This abduction, he said, had been masterminded by a neighboring country. On my way back to Montreal, I stopped in Paris and managed to go to the Quai d'Orsay, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There, I was told that the Syrians were denying seeing Albert or knowing his whereabouts. And since my dad is not even a French citizen, the Quai d'Orsay could not pursue their inquiry any further. However, I stayed in touch with Alain Poer, then president of the French Senate. I also appealed to the government of Canada through Senator Therese Gascon. I went to the Capitol in Washington, DC and presented my plea to Senator Jackson. I wrote to the Red Cross, I asked Amnesty International and all humanitarian associations for their help. Nobody could do anything. My dad's abduction signaled the beginning of the end for the Jewish community in Lebanon. In fact, a few months later, later armed Palestinians appeared at the office of Edouard Sasson, the Metro Goldwyn Mayor's representative in Lebanon, a Jew. They shot him at point blank range. From 1974 to 1978, Rabbi Shrem and Maître Selim Mourabi faced tough problems in order to protect the few Jews who remained in the area. The Christian Falange lent a hand and even the PLO sent a military unit to protect places of worship. <coughs> Rabbi Shem himself left the country under the bombs of the civil war in a tank held by Lebanese soldiers. However, between 1980 and 1987, abductions became widespread incidents. Jews were often targeted. Men were snatched off the street and summarily executed. In the meantime, clandestine immigration of Syrian Jews continued and as of 1975 received a great impulse thanks to a Canadian Ashkenazi woman, Judith Feltkar. She succeeded in negotiating with the Syrian Mohabarat the release of Jewish people from Syria. She paid the necessary ransoms and managed to free more than 3,000 Syrian Jews. Ultimately, although the Jewish community has vanished from Beirut, it is still thriving all over the world in Sao Paulo, Panama, Mexico, Brooklyn, Montreal, and in Europe. Today in Lebanon, there remains only a handful of Jews integrated in various communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. It's a very sad and a powerful story. Um, I'd like to now um, introduce Sami Surani. Uh, Sami was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and like many of his generation, their childhood recollection is full of events that took place during the Farhud and later. He left Iraq to Israel in 1950 at the beginning of the Exodus. He lived in the difficult days when Israel was just established. He studied economics at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and worked for a few years at the Ministry of Treasury, Government of Israel. Sammy came to Canada in 1963 and after working for nearly two years in the private sector, he got a position with the federal government in Ottawa, Department of Defense Production, 
as an economist statistician, statistician, excuse me. He served the federal government for nearly 38 years. During this period, he was awarded the Confederation Medal by the Governor General of Canada for his contribution to NAFTA, the North, North American Free Trade Negotiations and for other trade agreements. He received three citations for his contribution to policies of small business and developing Canadian sources for replacing imports, to name a few. Welcome, Sammy. Thank you, David. Eight years ago, a pogrom took place in Baghdad, Iraq, leaving about 1,000 Jews killed and nearly 2,000 Jewish owned stores vandalized. This happened during the Jewish Pentecostal feast, the 1st and 2nd of June, 1941. Unruly mobs that were poisoned by the anti-Jewish German propaganda and were frustrated by the failure of the pro-German revolution in Iraq found the Jews of Baghdad an easy target for revenge. The Jews of Baghdad did not possess any weapon to defend themselves. The mob stopped public buses, searched for Jewish passengers, and killed them on the spot. Other mobs broke into Jewish houses whose doors were previously marked with red paint, and they ransacked the house, killing men and children, raping and killing women. During the night, you could hear Jews crying and begging the mob to save the babies that mothers were holding. Prior to this period of turmoil, my parents had moved in temporarily with my grandparents who lived in the suburb of Baghdad. That for a day, we were all sitting in the living room and knowing and not knowing what would come next. My grandmother was lighting candles for Jewish prophets begging for mercy. My grandfather read passages of the psalm. I noticed my father looking at my three years old brother sleeping in his crib, saying to himself, why he brought innocent children to this cruel world. The tears were running down his cheek. Finally, in the second day, a Jordanian and British army division arrived to Baghdad from Transjordan to impose law and order. Using loudspeakers, they announced that Baghdad was now safe and they had everything under control. That's when my family and I headed back to our house in downtown. We found that the house was totally ransacked. Even the doors of the rooms were taken away, but we were happy to have escaped with our lives. I was only seven and I was traumatized and that left me fearful for a very long time. A few years later, the Far after the Farhood, things cooled down. Jews had to accept the fact that no country accepted them. They had to stay put and keep a low profile. That period was short-lived when the United Nations were addressing the issue of dividing the Holy Land, nationalistic feelings flared in all Arab countries. The hatred toward the Jews were intensified after the establishment of the State of Israel. Arab League president declared Jews are not welcome in Arab and Muslim countries. The, Ira the Iraqi government on its own was involved directly and indirectly in many issues. There were about eight points of policy that they followed. First, Jews denied a passport. Two, the Jews businessmen had to have a Muslim partner in order to get permit to work. Three, Jewish public servants were fired. Four, a law was passed that if you are suspicious of a person that is a Zionist, it is your obligation to report him to the authorities and leave the proof to the government to find out. Of course, if you hate a person, all what you have to do to say is that you suspect that this guy is a Zionist 
spy, and he will be put in prison. Five, Radio Baghdad had a group of actors called itself Zabaniya that made mockery of the late Shafiq Adas and the late Sir Eliezer Kadduri, two prominent Iraqi Jews. They have a program every Friday. Military kang six military kangaroo courts were established. And sometime, sometimes the accused was not allowed to have a lawyer to defend him. Seven, universities in Baghdad were not allowed to accept Jews. Eight, worst of all, some Jews were arrested, accused of Zionism, hanged in public. One permanent Jewish businessman was the late Shafiq Adas, who was hanged in public place in front of his house. Now, was there any country that wanted us, the Jews? It was one country. It was Spain under General Franco, who declared that the Jews of Iraq are descended of the Jews of Spain, who escaped Spain and the, the Ottoman Empire brought them to Iraq. So he was ready to give us a protection, citizenship, and he's ready to accept us to go to Spain. However, it was very hard for a Jew to walk down to the embassy. Once he goes to the embassy, the, uh, the Iraqi policeman will arrest him later and nobody will see him again. Now, how about the media? Was there any media that wrote about it, about what we suffered? I tried to, I was listening all the time to many uh, radio stations. One evening I was listening to the BBC England. And I was surprised to hear, they said, this is a news break. What was it? They said a poor, a little uh, Italian radio station had a freelance a journalist in Iraq who wanted to file a, a report. He had to go to leave Iraq to go to Cyprus and he placed the file through Cyprus to England. And the file was, the report was this, Iraqi government is treating the Jews very badly. Many of them were arrested, sent to prison, some hanged, and you name it. So I was quite surprised after that, it was, we felt that there is a certain pressure from the world on Iraq. The situation was unbearable. With the help of Kurdish smuggler, many Jews across the border to Iran. They left Iraq illegally. At this stage, international organization pressed Iraq to let the Jews go. Between 1950 and 1952, Almost 100 to over 120,000 Iraqi Jews left with only one suitcase. They were allowed to leave only after they surrendered their total holdings and their birthright. They would be persecuted if they returned to Iraq. I go to Israel. I had to live in a tent in a transitional camp. Life was extremely difficult. We came from well to do background, and now we were facing severe shortage of food and there were very scarce jobs. However, after a few years, things got better. People moved to their own apartments. They worked hard and flourished. Now, what about the 7,000 Jews who stayed in Iraq? The remaining Jews had to consolidate the community establishments that were built up over the centuries. The 68 synagogues that were in Baghdad were consolidated into three. The 25 Jewish schools were consolidated into two. The Iraqi government moved on its own to do the following. First, they abolished the status of Jews as a recognized ethnic minority in Iraqi laws. Second, Religion, on the religious side, three very ancient Jewish shrines of the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Ezra, and Joshua HaKohen were converted into mosque by moving Hebrew writing on the wall and replacing them with Arabic verses. Worst of all, the old Jewish cemetery of Baghdad was established in 1642, was demolished including the massive grave 
of the brotherhood victims. Generally speaking, the Jews lived with caution. Different regime came and went, and every time there, were, there was a change in government, the terrified Jews retreated in their corner. Under Saddam regime, nearly 50 Jews were tortured, some disappeared, nine men lost their lives in mass hanging in public squares where the mob danced and sang. The Saddam government also moved to freeze the assets of the remaining Jews, including their cash in the bank, despite being still Iraqi citizens living in Iraq. Again, the Jews were forced to risk their lives by crossing the border to Iran and help, with the help of Kurdish smugglers, leaving behind all their possessions. It is self-evidence that this was a systematic way of cleaning the Jewish community of Iraq. The players were the Iraqi government, its establishment, and the Iraqi public were worked together to get rid of the Jews. Today, the Iraq has three Jews left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sammy. That was uh, uh, excellent and very informative, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, now I'd like to call on Rabbi Maimon Pinto, who will give a short Dvar Torah, followed by Sass Perez will give a, a short presentation on uh, uh, the uh, grave sites in, in Iraq, and then followed by uh, Cantor Ben Lolo. Rabbi Pinto, please. Merci, David. Merci à vous tous d'être là ce soir pour la commémoration du, des déplacements des Juifs des terres arabes, et je pense que la correction aussi de l'Iran, si j'ai bien compris. Thank you, Mark for an outstand, astounding job here. He's running the whole show. And thank you all of you for being here tonight. Um, a personal testimony is that we just heard from Sammy and from Danielle. It's very touching. <clears throat> it may be bold and unpopular to say, but the fact is, is that we Jews war are and always will be regarded as made to feel like aliens, no matter where we are. It is not of our own choosing. It is a hard, stubborn, irreducible fact that no matter how extensive our political rights, no matter how deep our loyalty to the nations of which we are citizens, no matter how much we want to be accepted and not viewed as aliens, our very differentness makes us just that, that, aliens. The great economist Thornstein Veblen said of us that the Jew is an alien of uneasy feet, a wanderer in the intellectual no man's land, seeking another place to rest further along the road somewhere over the horizon. It is the Jew's differentness is being an alien, which is responsible to for the fact that he has shown himself as a leader in all kinds of progressive movements, in politics and labor and in economics, economics. Whether the alienation has evoked admiration or not of us or by us, the fact remains that we are strangers. Now, if that be so, are we faced with the very unappetizing conclusion that the Jews must forever and that the diaspora remain an alien and forever be doomed to unhappiness? Must it be so? Must we in all truthfulness concede that to be a Jew is to accept the faith of un un unhappiness and misery? I do not think so. It must be, it doesn't have to be so. And allow me to explain by an illustration drawn from this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion in Parashat Miketz, the rise of Joseph, 
And in ancient Egypt, he starts out as an immigrant, a slave, and a prisoner, unknown and unwanted. Within a short time, by the use of a lot of brain power, he becomes a powerful figure in the government and the second to Pharaoh alone. And a man of great personal wealth with a reputation as a wizard of finance. He marries into an important family and literally has the world eating out of his hands. The picture is not complete until we add the anti-climax, the one that the Torah tells us of Joseph. For all his success, for all his eminence, for all his fame, no Egyptian would eat with him. The verse states in the Torah, for the Egyptians would not break bread with him, for they considered it an ab abomination to eat with a Hebrew. The great Visroi of Egypt, savior of the empire and favorite of Pharaoh, he was viewed as an abomination to the most simple Egyptian because he was, after all, a Jew, an outsider, a foreigner, an alien. But Joseph, after all of this, above all, stays a happy man. Doesn't care one whit whether or not he is socially acceptable. He doesn't bother with worrying about not being invited to dine with his Egyptian peers. Loyal to Egypt, yes, but forcing himself upon them, not necessary. He has been successful in his undertakings and he is happy. He has two children. One of them he names Menashe in recognition of his gratitude that he has not forgotten that story, that he has forgotten the grudges against those who made his youth one stretch of uninterrupted misery. And the other, Ephraim, in thankfulness for his great success. He is an alien. He knows it, and yet he is supremely happy. Tonight, this annual commemoration of displacement of Jews from Arab lands falls on Hanukkah. I think it's very symbolic. Both of these times, Hanukkah and the commemoration tonight represent dark times in our collective Jewish history. I personally remember both my grandparents and their story of their exodus from Morocco. I heard it so many times growing up from my grandparents to my parents themselves. It was the fate of many Jews in Arab lands. The challenges, the fear they, fa they faced, the uncertainties that awaited them in the Holy Land that was so familiar and so strange at the same time. They left their homes, friends, community, and wealth in a land that they lived in for centuries. But I must say that I also remember my grandparents' courage, determination to provide for their families with very little means, with pride and dignity. My grandfather, Joseph Pinto, served in the army in Morocco. He was loyal to his country and fought to protect it. And he never, ever regretted doing so. But just like the story of Joseph in the Torah, he was an alien in his own native country, a country that turned its, backs, its back on him and his family. My grandfather eventually became one of the founders of the port of Ashdod, which was a home for many Olim from Morocco and was my birthplace. Like Joseph, they did not despair. They kept their chin up and they did so with, while staying supremely happy. Remember both of my grandparents, 
Joseph and Moshe. It is no coincidence that tonight's commemoration is, falls on Hanukkah, Chag Urim, in the modern term that is used today in Israel, which means the whole the holiday of lights. Hanukkah reminds us that we fight darkness with light. And in regards to tonight's commemoration, we must raise the awareness of the tragedies of our people and the displacement of Jews from Arab lands for their generations to come, lest we forget. And by so ultimately and hopefully pushing a lot of darkness, one light at a time. Excellent, thank you very much, Rabbi. Now I'd like to call on Sass Perez to come and he's, uh, Sass is a longtime Montrealer, a friend uh, I grew up with, and uh, he has a very interesting story to share. Thank you, David, and, and good evening, everyone. I know it's getting late, so I'm not going to take too much time. I happen to have the honor of being between the two bearded rabbis. <laughs> Rabbi Pinto just gave his speech, and after me is going to be Reverend Rabbi Cantor Ben Lolo. This is a story of, actually, a young boy and his grandson, in a sense, as we heard from one of the testimonials before. It is a story of disruption. And that is the theme I'm gonna to give tonight. I spoke last night at the event hosted by Or Shalom. And tonight I'm gonna to speak about this in the context of disruption, because I think it's fair to say that when you're a refugee, your life has been disrupted. But I'm gonna to try to do it from a perspective of light. It is Hanukkah. And I'm gonna to try to leave you with this thought. So go ahead. The first thing I'm showing you here is 1947. 1947, I want you to imagine Miss Iraq is a Jew. Think about it in the context of everything that you've heard, all the hardship that you've heard of, and yet in 47, they pick a Jewess to be Miss Iraq. She happens to be the mother eventually of my cousin, David Dangor, who is a great man who lives in London and has helped me a lot in this adventure. Now we're gonna skip forward all the way to 2017. What happens? A picture appears of Miss Israel and Miss Iraq at the Miss Universe pageant and they're together. This was disruption. This was terrible to so many people and yet such a beautiful picture for so many. A few months before that, my father had sent me an email of an event that occurred to him in a casino in London. He had met a parliamentarian from Iraq Al Jabouri, who said, we want the Jews to come back. Now, remember many of you and your parents had one-way tickets, one-way passports that were stamped, you can't go back. Now, suddenly a parliamentarian in Iraq is saying, I want you back. My father paused and responded to him that the only reason he'd go back is to go visit his father's grave, say the prayer, get back on the plane and leave again. A couple of months after that, he found out that his father's grave had been removed and therefore he wanted nothing to do actually with Iraq anymore. So this picture appeared on Facebook and I put one comment and it was a Muslim friend of mine who lives in the UK who posted it. And I said, Salam Alaikum, peace be upon you. It was a very nice picture to me. No sooner had I said that, next, than I get a message on my messenger from this guy called Ahmed Laif from Baghdad. No idea who he is, and I usually refuse those because often they're spam or phishing. But I said, there's something here going on. I accepted it. He said, I'm the manager of the pageant, and I want to contact your cousin, David Dangor. He actually had the picture of his mother, Renee, on his office still all this time. I said, why? He says, because since that picture, I've lost all my sponsors. The government has banished me. I'm not allowed to do Miss Iraq ever again, and I have threats against my life. Wow. I said, I'll ask David. I asked David. He said, sure, have him contact me. Then I thought about it. I said, you're in Baghdad? He said, yeah. I said, do you know where there's a Jewish cemetery? He said, yeah. I said, where? He said, Sadr City. I said, you're kidding me. We've heard of Sadr City for many other reasons since. I said, uh, on a hunch, would you help me find out if my grandfather's grave is there? He said, absolutely. Again, took a little money as usual. There was the guard, there was the doorkeeper, there was the gardener, there was all a bunch of people. And I said, fine, no problem. He asked me for my grandfather's name, which is Sasson Moshi Paris. He asked me for the year of death. I gave him the year of death. 
he went and got a Hebrew translator from the Baghdad University. And within 48 hours, he sent me this picture. This is my paternal grandfather's gravestone. It survived the transfer between the cemeteries, which occurred when the old ruler said the Jews, Jewish cemetery couldn't stay anymore because of some development and Jews rushed to transfer the gravestones from one site to another. Now, what did this lead to? You saw Sami Sarani earlier tonight. I got this picture, I was in shock. How do I deal with this? My father's written it off. Very delicately was presented to my dad. And at some point someone said, we need to keep this private. And I said, wait a minute, like, wait a minute. There's 4,000 graves there. There's 4,000 families that have an opportunity to reconnect with someone from their family, but no opportunity to visit that grave. This is bigger than us. This is about so many other people, not just in Iraq, by the way. We've heard a lot about Iraq tonight, but in so many other countries where people cannot visit their family. Go back, no, go back a picture. So this picture was amazing. The day after, he sends me this picture. They're crowded around my grandfather's gravestone with four candles. It's Shabbat. Now, four candles wouldn't mean much to most, except that my grandfather and grandmother had four children. So I took that as a sign that I have to continue. Next. You see that, uh, the pictures of this condition of the, of the cemetery? People were using it as a dumpster. He said, what do we do? I said, we clean it. I need you to clean it. He found a crew, more money, but he did it. They went about cleaning it until the government found out about it. When the government found out about it, we had about 150 gravestones already taken pictures of, we had to stop. Once I had this collection, I reached out, I think rabbis over here, and I said, what do we do? Sami Sarani's name came up, one of our speakers. I said, can you help me translate as many of these so that people can read it if they don't read old Hebrew by chance? And he did. Sami must have spent 10 hours with me in my office a few Shabbats where we actually did it, we put the names down and we've recorded these in an album online. Next. Now, you see the picture of all of them. So in 2018, what we decided at the synagogue was we're gonna do a little Kaddish for all of the people who couldn't leave, the people who couldn't be refugees, they were just not living anymore. And we wanted to make sure they were not forgotten. So we did it and we had 12 synagogues and a church who all said prayers over those left behind in Arab lands. Next. Next. Now this is Father John Walsh. He was the man of the church. Father John Walsh, a great friend to the Jewish community in Montreal and an amazing friend to Israel who spoke fluent Hebrew because the Pope had sent him to Israel to represent him in that land many years ago. Father Walsh wrote that beautiful, beautiful prayer that you see there. And it was just such a touching thing that we crossed lines, we crossed borders, and it didn't matter where you were from. This was some, a story that had to be told. Next. Now we're in 2019. I get another message on Facebook. I can help you find any relatives in a Lebanese cemetery. This time I found my maternal great-grandfather. So I found his grave, go ahead. Just a few days later, this was sent to me and this is his gravestone. Again, points of light. That's what I'm trying to focus on, go ahead. In 2019, things took off. 50 synagogues across North America, across the UK, in Brazil, in Israel, in France, said the Kaddish together on the same day. And then in 2020, go ahead, we had COVID. So everything came to a stop that was live. There was no way to do it face to face, but guess what happened? It became a global initiative thanks to David Dengour, the son of Rene. 16,000 downloads of a beautiful prayer that we're gonna hear very shortly from Reverend Rabbi Cantor Ben Lobo. 
which basically brought us all together, even though we couldn't physically be together like some of us are tonight. This is just a picture to, to demonstrate that each of us remembers in a different way, and that's okay. Each of us mourns in a different way, and that's okay. This is a painting done by my cousin, Shaul, a direct descendant also of our grandfather in commemoration of this discovery. And finally, on Facebook, you can now find pictures that we've posted of several Jewish cemeteries in several Arab lands so that people can look to see if they discover a family member. The Kaddish Initiative, as it's known, is also on Facebook, and you can go there and see some of the great articles in the Jerusalem Post that were written by David on this occasion. And in fact, two days ago was another one. I didn't have time to put it on the presentation, but you could go look it up, David Dengor J. Post, in which he talks about the fact that the reality of Sephardi and Israeli Jews is not known enough that that story has to be told. If we want true unity amongst all Jews, it must be known as well. These are the, um, it can be made available later, David, perhaps. These are the websites where you can find several hundred pictures of these gravestones. And I know that somebody here discovered one of her family members as a result of it. Next. Now, my grandfather and grandmother's children eventually made 13 grandchildren. His name is Sasson Moshi Paris, and so is mine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please rise for a special prayer dedicated. <laughs> Well, 
Well, that concludes our evening. Thank you to all. Sorry. Sorry it went so long, but it was, uh, I think, very meaningful. And uh, we gave due respect uh, to this, uh, to this uh, special day. So thank you again, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.